Mike Radich here, and I'm now joined on the phone by WFC lightweight champion Josh Emmett. Josh, how are you? Good, good. How you doing? Thanks for having me on. Sure, no problem. Thanks for doing it. WFC lightweight champion. How good does that sound? It almost didn't happen. Yeah, it sounds, uh, sounds great now, you know. I had a, a great performance. I was uh, the most I've ever been prepared for a fight. And, uh, yeah, like you said, it, it almost didn't happen just because of a little bit of controversy. And I can get into that a little bit later. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, it sounds great, though. Really excited that it was overturned and, and uh, the belt in the right hands now. Mm-hmm. We'll get to all the controversy in a little bit. But first, has WFC given you the actual belt yet? Yeah, they have, actually. Um, Friday morning, uh, they just did a little ceremony at... Um, Team Alpha Male headquarters at Uriah's gym. Mm-hmm. Um, instead of just like meeting up in a parking lot and, and getting it from Brandon, the right. owner of West mm-hmm. Coast, uh, he just kind of announced online early Friday morning that they were going to do a little ceremony. So they actually came to the gym. Um, they filmed it, so they'll edit it and they'll put it up probably a little later this week. And uh, Andre, um, he interviewed me just like he would in the actual fight itself. And then we took some pictures and they presented me with the belt. Oh, okay. A lot of my friends and family came out. Even our notice, because I I saw that, and then I posted some stuff within an hour, and then I still had quite a bit of, like, 20, a little over 20 people still show up on an hour's notice. You know, if I would have had, you know, a day or something like that, then I probably would have had, you know, a few hundred people out there again. Oh, okay. Okay, I see. I see. That's cool. That's good that they were able to to give you the belt and make a, a little a ceremony to give you the championship belt because obviously they didn't give it to you on fight night. But we'll get into that a little bit later. Now, I'm just curious, how much does this belt mean to you? Obviously, your entire career basically has been fighting for West Coast. You have one fight outside the organization, but pretty much you've grown up in this organization. How much does it mean to you to finally have this belt? Obviously, in the big picture, it's it's a building block and it's a regional title, but this has to mean something to you because you've been fighting for this organization in your entire career, basically. Yeah, so it, it, it means a lot to me. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, just as far as I, I've seen some of the other, actually some of my teammates um, kind of grew up in the in the West Coast Fighting Championship as well. Like Andre Feely was the featherweight champion right. mm-hmm. um, before he got, you know, got the call to the UFC. And then Anthony Avila, one of my other teammates, he was the 155 champion. So I thought it would always be cool to be a champion in one of the divisions, but... You know, as they were champions, I, I knew I wasn't ever going to get it because I was never going to fight my teammates. So, uh, yeah, so it, it does mean a lot to me, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be a part of their organization and, and everything they've done for me and Brandon Ware and a lot of the um, Jeff and James who work for the production as well. So it does mean a lot, but I'm hoping that bigger things will come in the near future and then I can, you know, reach my, my goal is to get to the UFC. And then once I reach that goal, I'll have to set new goals. Uh, when I accomplish that. Mm-hmm. Definitely, definitely. Now, in the big picture, you got the title belt and you remained undefeated. Uh, so in the big picture, everything's good. But at the same time, are you a little bit disappointed that you were kind of robbed of, of that whole moment? Obviously, West Coast kind of made it up to you because they gave you this little ceremony with the belt. But are you a little bit disappointed that you didn't get the belt on fight night, you, you didn't get the, the ring announcer saying the new champion and Brandon Ware wrapping a championship belt around your waist. Are you a little disappointed that you, you were robbed of that moment? Yeah, just a little bit. I think, uh, for, honestly, for me, not so much, but I think more of my mm-hmm. friends and family and you know fans and, and coaches and teammates, I think they were a lot more upset than I actually was. Um, I think in the long run, just because everybody, like my, my social media and my phone has not stopped blowing up since that, you know, since that had happened. And then, you know, we started the appeal process and then the commission overturned it and they, they found out they made some mistakes that night. And so then it, it kind of started all over again. It blew up and then when they presented me with the belt, and it, it, so it's been going on, you know, for the past week nonstop. So I think in the long run, it's been better just because I've got like a lot more, I guess, attention you could say, but, mm-hmm. you know, my family and friends and coaches, everyone was, it was crazy in there. And just in the arena, the, the crowd was going nuts. I think Brandon Ware and the police, they started kicking people out because it was, it was just crazy. Everyone was doing and like, they thought there was going to be a big riot because there were so many people there for me, but a lot of them were my friends and family. So of course there wasn't going to be anything bad happened, but it was just, it 
was nuts how, how loud everyone was and disappointed people were. Just curious, how many people were at the event to support you? How many tickets did you sell, and how many people did you personally invite to the fight? Uh, so uh, there, there was a few thousand people at the event. Um, mm-hmm. I personally handed out, um, I don't know, close to 300. There's people that bought online sales from me um, as well. And then I have a lot of just family and friends across the country that actually order the pay-per-view and uh, stream it online, and they have big, like, viewing parties. Uh, my my little brother James, he's in the military. He's an MP in Louisiana. So every time I have a fight, he has like thirty of his army buddies show up, and they have like just a big party. I also ship out a lot of my fight shirts to them, so they're all wearing them. Same thing with my uh, little sister Sarah. Her husband's in the military in Arizona. Same type of thing. And then I have family just all over the country, like uh, from my mom's side to Lowry's and and uh, everyone else. It's, it's just nuts. Everyone's like taking pictures and having these big parties across the country as well. Mm-hmm. I see, I see. Now let's get to the fight itself. The fight took place back on November 15th. It was at West Coast Fighting Championships 12. It was the main event. You officially won the fight by technical decision. 24 seconds into the fifth round, that's when the bout was halted. Originally, it was ruled a no contest. We'll get to that in a minute, but let's go step by step here. Let's Let's start with this. What exactly was your game plan going into the fight, and how well do you think you executed it? Um, so my my game plan, I, I, I rarely ever have game plans just because I feel that if uh, if you go in there and you can't execute your game plan, then what do you do? You know, you're kind of right. in a bad situation. So I, uh, for the most part, I was just going to go out there. I've been working a lot of um, boxing with uh, my, my boxing coach, Joey, out of Flawless Boxing. So I've been doing that. I've been working some um, we tied with Justin Buckles and, and Martin Canton and my uh, jiu-jitsu coach, Felipe, a lot of that. So I was just going to go in there and just focus on stuffing his takedown, you know, stand up and strike and, and, and kind of just outstrike him and uh, not go to the ground. That was my plan just because Brandon was such a high-level brown belt under a good uh, jiu-jitsu tree. So, uh, so I, I executed it really well. Went out there in the first round, stuffed a few of his takedowns, and uh, I was getting the better of the exchanges on the feet. Mm-hmm. Um, going into the second round, we were doing kind of the same thing. And then he kind of rushed in and just instinctually I shot in, took him down. And I uh, I kind of felt him out in the second round on the ground. So he, he was he was actually really good. He was going for, you know, transitioning really well from, you know, position to position, move to move. But I could just, I knew what he was going to do next. I was really focusing on just shutting his six down and uh, shutting his offense down pretty much and doing a, a great job. But I was kind of scaring some of my, my teammates and uh, jiu-jitsu coach and stuff like that. They kept yelling, like, stand up, stand up, just because he was such a high-level jiu-jitsu player mm-hmm. and he was pulling the rubber guard and all that. But, but I felt great, so I, I just continued, you know, just kind of mixing it up. I would go out, I'd strike, and then when I felt comfortable, I'd take him down and do, work a little ground and pound. And I was never in a bad position, and he was never even close to catching me in anything. I failed to mention earlier your opponent was uh, Brandon Rossetti, Rossetti? I, I think it's Rossetti. Yeah, Re- yeah, Brandon Rossetti. Rossetti, yes. Brandon Rossetti, he was your opponent. I, I, I didn't mention that in the beginning there, but uh, he was your opponent. I'm just curious, the first four rounds, obviously you won all four of those rounds. It was a shutout going into that fifth round, which we'll get a little bit later into. We'll, we'll dive into that a little bit. Uh, that's where the controversy stems from. But the first four rounds, how were you feeling about your performance? Uh, I, I was feeling great. I uh, I knew I was dominating the fight, uh, winning every second of the fight. Just like I said, I was never in a bad position. I was out striking him on his feet. I was taking him down, landing huge elbows and punches. And, uh, yeah, I just executed my game plan and, and had had the best performance, I guess you could say, of my career so far. And Brandon, being such a tough, tough fighter, he was, uh, as an amateur, I think he was, I think it was like three or four and one, all submissions. He finished the fight. Um, and as a professional, he was seven and no. Six of all finishes as well, submissions. Six of them coming in the first round and one of them coming in the second round when he beat Thomas Dion from AKA, who was the current WFC lightweight champion. He beat him in the, the minute, I think it was a minute 20 into the second round. So he had never fought longer than you know, seven minutes, and he's finished everybody. So that's why I was kind of a little hesitant, just kind of not so much nervous, but I just I, I respected his jujitsu because I I seen him finish everyone, and he finished good guys, and he was such a high level brown belt. But I trained with the best, so 
I wasn't too worried. <laughs> now, going into the fifth round, you were up four rounds to zero. It was clear. So I'm just curious, what was your corner telling you going into the fifth round? Were they telling you to just keep doing what you're doing? Were they telling you to, to coast and play it safe? Were they telling you to go for the kill? What were they telling you going into that fifth round? Yeah, pretty much go for the kill. I, um, I've never fought a five. That was my first title fight. My first, I've never fought five rounds before, so I wasn't really sure how I was going to feel. I knew I was in great shape, but still you can never really know how it's going to work out. Um, so going into the fifth round, I felt great. As soon as Buckles came into my corner, he said, how do you feel? I said, great. I'm feeling better and better each round. And he said, okay, go out there and finish him. I said, okay, I'll finish him this round. So that's why I came out kind of hard, and uh, I was planning on just putting it on him. I, I feel because I watched the video, and I, I've seen a few times in the video that I think if I would have stayed on him, I could have definitely finished the fight, but I kind of came back, and we were just kind of exchanging back and forth. But this time in the fifth round, I was going to go out there and just nonstop until the fight was over. So that's what I was doing. And, uh, yeah, so I, I, I came in, I threw, you know, a few punches. I caught him with a right hook. I kind of dropped him, and that's when he shot in for a double leg. And just instinctual, it was just a reaction. I just threw a knee. His knee barely touched the ground, mm -hmm. and uh, it caught him in the, like, right under the chin, mm -hmm. right in the chin pretty much. And he was still fighting, so right. uh, we went to the ground. I whizzed hard, kind of um, hipped in, and he pulled guard. So he, he hooked his leg over me. He had a deep underhook. And he was holding on really tight, and I was in side control, so I was trying to push his head away to work some ground and pound and hopefully finish him. And that's when the, the ref stopped in and uh, said it was a unintentional foul, and they were going to give him some time, and then that's just when everything started happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, in the fight, did you know that you caught him on the chin? Because the video I saw of the fight, which I'm sure is the same video you saw, but um, it looked like it kind of landed around the, the neck, the throat area. It didn't look like it landed in the head, so I thought maybe it slid up after the initial contact, and that's what caught him on the chin. I, I'm kind of confused here. In, in the actual fight, did you know you caught him on the chin? I didn't even know. I just I didn't even know his uh, knee was mm -hmm. down. I and I didn't even have time to think about it. He just shot in, and I just reacted. Mm -hmm. It was just like a split second. But the only thing is, I knew he was fighting still. Like he was holding on so tight, so he was fighting, and and I didn't really. I honestly didn't even know what was going on until I actually watched the video. That's how I feel about the whole fight. Like I don't even. It's just surreal. I'm just like tunnel vision. I don't even know what I'm doing. The only thing that. Uh, it's kind of going through my head is when they land punches on me. I'm not thinking about how well I'm doing. I'm just like, oh, he hit me. I'm losing the fight. And then when I watch the actual fight, I'm like, oh, I was dominating the stand-up. Mm -hmm. Now, from the reports I read of this fight, he was carried out on a stretcher. I heard that. That's what happened after uh, you know all the, the dust settled. Do you think he was really hurt because obviously what you just said you know he he was still fighting he, he grabbed onto you 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 thought the fight was going to continue to go until the referee pulled you guys apart do you think he wanted out of that fight because obviously it wasn't going his way do you think that he was looking for a way out i, I do i honestly do um and that's why i was so frustrated that night but uh just the way i saw him like he was holding on to me so tight like i keep saying and then as soon as the ref saw that i looked down and he kind of looked up and i i think that was just he was so exhausted. He knew he was losing the fight. I think that was just, that was his way out of the fight. And so then he rolls over and just like, I, I like, I keep saying, I was like, oh, he went all Hollywood, but I was like, it was like the worst acting. It just looked like so fake to me. And then he, he stood up and couldn't sit on the chair. And then he like fell down all slow. And I was just like, man, come on, don't, don't go out that way. So I was just frustrated. But then he did end up, the doctors came in and, you know, if you tell the doctor anything like, oh, can you, you know, where are you or can you see? If you say you don't know where you are, you can't see, you know they're going to stop the fight mm -hmm. away. So I don't know exactly what the doctor said to him because I couldn't go over there. But uh, um, he wanted out, so the rest stopped the fight. And then, of course, the paramedics come in and uh, they put him on a stretcher and then they have to put on a, a neck brace and all this type of stuff and carry him out. Mm -hmm. And then to find out, I feel kind of bad for him because later on I found out he had to go to the hospital. They did a bunch of x-rays. And uh, I ended up breaking his orbital bone and his nose in the fight. Not not necessarily from the knee or anything, but because even if you look at the video going into the the fifth round when he's in his corner in the fourth round, his his eyes all swollen, his nose is messed up. So I it, I can guarantee before the knee, I promise it wasn't from the knee because I I hit him like in his chin neck area. But uh, so I feel bad for the guy. I don't wish harm on anybody. So I hope he's doing well now and. Uh, he'll have a good, successful career later on down the road. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Now, when the the dust settled and they said, "Okay, he can't continue," so we're gonna you know call you guys to the center of the cage. Did you think, okay, well, it was an, an unintentional foul? We've already completed three rounds, so so we've already gone longer than than what's needed to go to the scorecards and make it a technical decision. Were you breathing easy? Were you like, okay, you know, this is what's going to happen, and 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 just waiting for them to wrap the belt around your waist, or were you kind of like, you know, I don't really know what they're going to say about this. This is kind of un, uncharted waters. You know, how were you feeling before they read what the decision was? Yeah, I, I was just, I was really nervous at first. I thought if the first thing going through my head is when that happened, I thought I was going to get DQ'd and get a loss on my record, and he was going to mm-hmm. get a win. Mm-hmm. I didn't really know how it worked, so I was kind of freaking out and just like, you know, really upset about that. Like, how can I beat, you know, dominate someone for 22 minutes and then get a loss on my record? But then I have Uriah in the corner, and he's telling me, "Oh, you'll be fine." This and this, and Justin Buckles and you know Martin Campman, they're all in my corner. Um, telling me, oh yeah, it'll go to the scorecards, you're fine, don't worry. So then I start to feel a little better. I'm like, okay. I, I just had no idea what was going on. And so I'm thinking it's still going to go to the scorecards like they were saying. And uh, and then the you know the, the ref came in and they ruled it a, a no decision, a no contest. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, I was just, I, I ended up just leaving, walking out of the cage because I was so, so upset. And uh, yeah, that's about it. I just walked back to the room, got checked out by the doctor and just just took off, you know. Mm-hmm. Now, what's your mindset backstage? You know, obviously, you just got some bad news. I mean, it wasn't a loss, but it was, you know, pretty close. You you dominated him for four rounds and then still didn't get the belt or get a W next to your name. So, um, you know, what were you feeling like at this time? I, I was just, I, I was so, so pissed, so mad. I, couldn't, I can't even describe how, how upset I was. And then I, uh, I just... I was angry. I thought every, uh, I thought like all my hard work was for nothing. And, you know, it, it, yeah, man, that's basically how I felt. And then, you know, after just talking to Uriah, he, mm-hmm. he's always so positive. He was just telling me, like, he's like, don't worry about it. It's not going to affect you negatively, you know, because it's no context. Your, mm-hmm. your record right. still going to be 6 and 0. Mm-hmm. He's like, but you had a great performance. You know, no one can take that away from you. And I, and it was good because I, I grew from the fight, too. You know, I, and now I know I can go five rounds. I could have won another few rounds. I felt so good. So uh, that that kind of calmed me down. And then I just thought about it. And I was like, okay, you know. But before I talked to him, I was just I was furious. Mm-hmm. Now, after you talked to all your teammates and the time passed, and and you left the venue and all that kind of stuff, were you feeling a little bit better when you when you looked at what the options going forward could be? Obviously, there was going to be an appeal and try to get this decision. Uh, overturn and get it to a win on your record instead of a no contest. When did you start saying to yourself, okay, you know, it's going to be fine. Uh, I think, you know, we have a very good case going forward on this. I think it's going to be uh, working in our favor. You know, when did you start to think that? How how long had passed after the fight when you started saying, okay, I think we can get this overturned? It was, it was kind of immediately, like after I talked to Uriah and then Justin um, and Uriah, they actually called someone that they know that works for the Athletic Commission and she, she opened the book and she read the ruling of the book. So it was exactly what she stated was that I, it should have went to the scorecards. I should have won right there. So then it made me feel a little better. Um, and, and then they kind of told me about the whole appeal process. I didn't even know you could do that. So they're like, yeah, we're going to appeal it. They have five days to appeal it. They're like, we're going to appeal it first thing Monday morning. Um, yeah. And they're like, it, it, it should get overturned just by basically reading the rule out of the book. If it goes past the third round, Whoever was winning, it should go to the, the scorecards, and then they'd be awarded the win right then. And the other thing that was uh, come to find out a little bit later, um, after they overturned the uh, the no contest in in my favor to win, I actually went down to the athletic commission um, and met with the commissioner um, Andy, and he actually told me he was down at down south at Bellator when Tito was fighting Bonner. Mm-hmm. And he said it was just so loud in the arena. So someone from my fight had called him, but they just couldn't really hear. So it was a miscommunication. The lady said that there was an unintentional foul. And he said, okay, what happened? He said it was the knee, this and this. He said who was winning on the scorecard is Josh was. And they said, okay, then no contest. Because the only thing that he heard was it was an intentional knee. Mm-hmm. He didn't okay. hear the unintentional. So it was just a miscommunication. And then he, he just, he was really nice, Andy Foster. He just, you know, 
gave me my letter. He signed it. And he was just saying, like, you know, I apologize for this and this and uh, what happened. You should have been awarded your belt that night. But I was like, you know, and it's okay as long as I, I get the win and all my hard work kind of paid off. So that's, that's kind of the whole situation that happened after that. Okay, okay. I knew there had to be a good story behind it because we've seen this happen in the past. Uh, when Don Cerrone fought against Jamie Varner, a similar situation like this happened, and they went to the scorecards, and then Jamie Varner won a technical decision. So I knew there had to be a good story behind it because I was thinking to myself, you know, why didn't anyone from the commission get this right? I, I was I was thinking to myself, like, what what's going on here? How come... How come they weren't able to get it right? So I'm happy that that there was a good story behind it because I was getting a little worried with these commissions. You never know. <laughs> yeah, he just he said it was loud at our event because all everyone was booing and yelling TKO and stuff like this, and then it was loud when you know the the Bonner um, Tito Ortiz fight was going on. So he just he didn't hear the unintentional part. He just heard the intentional part. So that that's where it kind of went wrong. Maybe next time they should do an email or a text so it's like as you know just clear as clear as day, but. Okay. Right, right. I hear you. I hear you. This fight between you and Brandon Rossetti featured two undefeated fighters. You're undefeated. Before that fight, he was undefeated, and you guys were fighting for a title. Now, I know it's a weird question. I know it's going to sound weird, but did you feel bad for him after the fight? Obviously, a lot of stuff happened. There was a lot of controversy, and I know that this is a combat sport. You guys are fighting. You were going in there to try to beat him up and take his belt. He was trying to go in there and beat you up to keep his belt. So I know it's a combat sport, and I know you guys are fighting, but did you feel bad for him at all? Did you have any compassion for him after the fight? Uh, the way he went out, he had to deal with a lot of criticism. The, you know, he, he lost the fight four rounds. He beat him fair and square the first four rounds, and then there was a little bit of controversy in the fifth round. Did you feel bad for him at all? I, I know it's a weird question, but did you feel bad at all for him after the fight? Yeah, no, definitely I did. Uh, just like I said, like in a perfect world or a perfect fight, mm-hmm. you know, I would, I want two guys to go in there. I want to, obviously I want to win the fight and we mm-hmm. both walk out of there knowing with injuries, of course. I know there's going to be bangs and bruises, but no serious in- injury. I'd hate to like hurt someone or, or be hurt, but you know, that's just kind of the, the nature of the sport. It's kind of, that's what you sign up for. He's, you know, he's going in there trying to, you know, embarrass me and hurt me in front of my friends and family and I'm, and I'm not going to let that happen but it, but in the end once I found out he was actually hurt then I, you know like I said I mm-hmm. I feel sorry for him and hopefully he has a fast recovery and you no know, like long term injuries from that and everything goes well um, and then just the whole social media thing I think everyone was I felt kind of bad because everyone was tagging him and stuff and this and that and it was just like I was almost to a point I was like man that's a little too much you know he's already he, he got a loss, he got hurt, and now people are just, like, constantly on him. Like, so he's seeing all this stuff. So it, it's kind of nice. So I do have sympathy for him. And even even I said some stuff, like, on Twitter to, I think, him and his his team after the fact that I, I went ahead and removed just because of, I was frustrated and someone said something about, you know, tough loss, Josh, and that's when I just went off. Like, I didn't lose. There was no contest and said some things that I probably shouldn't have, but. I took that off, and uh, yeah, so I wish him the best, though. Mm-hmm. I see, I see. Now, 2014 is winding down. You're 4-0 this year for 2014. You won a belt this year. Give yourself a grade for 2014. It has to be an A, right? Yeah, I've. Uh, this was my sixth fight in 15 months. 15 months. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of hard. I, uh, I started a little late in the game. I... Um, Maybe two. I, I started training in 2006 when Uriah opened his gym, and then I actually was really interested in fighting. But I got a wrestling scholarship, so I went down to the the Bay Area Menlo College on a wrestling scholarship, and uh, knew that I was going to come back, continue to fight after I graduated college. I knew I'd get better at wrestling, and I would get my degree. So I wanted to go ahead and do that. I came back in 2010, started training, and then I fought in 2011. I did a few amateur fights. Um, after that, I. I did my first pro fight, I think that was 2011 as well, and I broke my hand in that fight. So I just had a little, actually a long layoff. So I broke my hand, I had surgery, did all the physical therapy, came back. I was training again after 10 months, training for another fight. My last sparring session um, before my, it was going to be my second pro fight, I broke my hand in the exact same spot again. So then again, I had surgery, 
I was off for another 10 months. So I had like a two year layoff. So, and I'm getting older. So that's why I've just been on a little roll. So last year, or actually 2013, um, in September, I had my first fight with West Coast Fighting, and I've been fighting ever since, like every three months, two to three months, just trying to stay healthy and just, you know, go on a little run, hopefully getting into the UFC. Um, and, and my goal last year after my first fight with West Coast, I said, you know, by the end of 2014, I want to be 7-0 and with a title, either 45s or 55s, and 2015, I want to be in the UFC. So I'm kind of right on track with what I've wrote out. So everything's going according to plan, and I'm hoping to get to the next level in 2015. Mm-hmm. What's in the water at Menlo College? There's a lot of great fighters that are coming out of there. A teammate of yours, of course, Danny Castillo, he went there. Uh, some good women who fight in mixed martial arts have come out of there, Carl Esparza and Ashley Evan smith What's going on there? I know, it's kind of, it's kind of crazy. and I, uh, It's funny because Danny, he's a little older than I, but he's, right. he's from Sacramento. We both wrestled at the same junior college, Sac City College, under our coach, David Pachenko. And then we went to Menlo College. And then all those, those two, or actually those two fighters you just named, I went to school and wrestled with uh, Carla Suarza and Ashley Evan Smith, and then also Cody Gibson. He's in the UFC. We mm-hmm. were on the same team as well. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a 135 right, fighter right. in the UFC right now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And even I have some uh, one of my good friends, Lee Morrison. He's doing MMA. He's actually, I, I want to say he's like, Ten and two, ten and three. Yeah, he's fighting it over and fights um, for M one. Yeah, the American Bulldog. Yeah, yeah, that was my good friend. So mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of crazy. I think you know if I can get to the UFC, there's four people right now, and they're from Menlo. If I get there, there'll be five. I was saying I think that that'll be the most active fighters in the UFC from Menlo College because I know before it was Arizona State. It was like Kane, CB Dalloway, Aaron Simpson, and um, Ryan Bader. So four. I think Menlo would have the uh, <laughs> they'd have the advantage right there, but I, I don't know. It's just it's kind of funny that we're all we're like good wrestlers, and then we're all doing so well in the MMA world. Hmm. Who would ever thought a small place like Menlo College breeding the MMA stars of tomorrow? Hmm. It's funny. <laughs> Who would have thought? Yeah, it's just a little private school, yeah. NAIA, and uh, one of the the richest. Cities in the the country. <laughs> yeah, you would not think that yeah. they're going to produce some good fighters. Now, Josh, I'm just curious. Two two questions about tattoos here. Uh, I'm, I'm very curious about this. Uh, number one, you have a tattoo on the left side of your ribs. What does that say? There, there's some words there. What does that say? So that's a um, it's a poem that my my little brother that's in the military. We kind of came up with. Um, kind of put together. We both have that tattooed on the the left side of our ribs. It's just um, it says brothers share a special bond, like blood brotherhood. It's thicker than water. Friends may come and go. Relationships may drift apart, but brothers are forever. And though the sun may rise in the east and set in the west, we'll still be brothers. What God has ordained, no man can change. Brothers are forever. So. That's a little thing that my my little brother and I put together before he went off to the army. Oh, okay, okay. I was just curious about that because I I saw that. I saw a picture of you and I saw that tattoo, so I was just curious about that. Now, the second one I want to ask you about is on the right side of your body. It's it's kind of a combo chest and shoulder thing you got there. What exactly is that? So it's just a Japanese art. Um, It was actually, I had a, uh, just been a big fan of um, Japanese tattoo and so it's a lot of uh, water, and it has some lotus flowers, um, cherry blossom flowers, a, a clownfish, and then on my chest there's a, a tiki mask um, and some hibiscus flowers. So I've had that for about ten years, actually. So it's still pretty vibrant, and just a big, you know, fan of tattoos. And you know, I, I worked with uh, Bill Liberty. He's one of the better tattoo artists, and he's been around forever here in the Sacramento. Now he's in Folsom area. And he does great work, and yeah, he was one of the best. Mm-hmm. I see, I see. Now, earlier you mentioned that your goal, like a lot of fighters in this sport, your goal is to make it to the UFC. So I'm just curious, how close do you think you are? One fight, two fights, three fights, more or less? How close do you think you are? Uh, I, I think I'm, it's just so hard. I, I, I've heard different things. and uh, when Actually, when um, the UFC came to Sacramento, when... 
TJ, Joe Shaw was supposed to fight Burrell for the second time. Right. Uh, and mm-hmm. he got switched up to Soto. Right. I actually almost got on the card uh, for that one. I almost got signed with the UFC. Uh, they were trying to make a 55 fight. Um, your eye was telling me it's pretty sure this is going to happen for you. You're going to get in, but we'll find out later on this evening. Um, they ended up going with someone else from the Central Valley. I think it was um, it was actually one of Cody's teammates. Um, he was the first fight on that card. He fought Chris Wade. Um, he got submitted in 45 seconds, I believe. But uh, so it didn't go my my way. Uh, later on, um, I, one of the fights in San Jose, I went to to the fight, and then Uriah introduced me to Joe Silva and Sean Shelby. Um, they also sent them all my my tapes and stuff like that, and so they they like my style. Um, they just weren't happy with my last fight. Well, five and zero at the time. They weren't happy with me fighting Tremaine Smith because he had, I think his record was like five and six or five and seven. So he had a losing record, but it was just because all my opponents were backing out, backing out. So I fought at forty five and fifty five. He's normally a uh, one seventy and a right. one eighty five fighter. Right. Right. And so with a week notice, he said he'd take the fight, and so we did a catch weight at 160. But if I would have fought my initial opponent, Tony Rios, then maybe I would have got in because um, he, he would have had a better record and he was a strike force vet, tough kid. So um, what Joe Silva said is they like me. They just want me to have a little more experience, maybe one or two more wins. So then I went ahead and I fought Tony Rios. I beat him, so I was 6-0, and, and then I went ahead – and uh, I wanted to fight a good fighter, someone with a perfect record. So I fought. That's why I asked for the fight to fight Brandon Rossetti. And uh, so I fought him. I beat him. So that's two wins. So, so who knows? Um, right. They say I'm right there on the radar. They've been watching me. They know who I am. Um, so I'm hoping it'll happen soon. Maybe it is one fight. Maybe it's two. Maybe someone gets gets hurt, and I'm a late replacement. But I'll fight. You know, I told him I'll fight anyone at 45 or 55 just to get my foot in the door. Mm-hmm. So. Hopefully, but hopefully soon. But you never know. I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. I guess. Right, right. Yeah, you never know. You never know when they're going to call your name. You, you never know. The, there's so many shows these days, and and uh, with so many shows, that means there's a lot of fighters that have to be on these shows, and that also that means uh, you know there's a, a higher chance of somebody dropping out due to injury. So uh, you, you never know. You're 100 percent right. You, you never know when they're when they're going to come calling. But now I'm just curious. You brought up weight class. You fought both at lightweight and featherweight. Uh, going forward, are you going to stick at lightweight? I know you said you, you do whatever the UFC wants to get your foot in the door, but but you know, uh, advancing your career going forward, are you going to stay at lightweight or are you going to drop back down to featherweight? Um, right now, I kind of want to stay at lightweight just because I, I feel so good. In college, I wrestled at 157 pounds, and so I was cutting weight on a weekly basis. Um, so I feel I feel great at. 155 at lightweight, it's still a hard cut for me, but 45 is such a difficult cut, and uh, you know, just like the longevity, I know it's so bad on my body and my organs, even though I'm, I'm eating right now, I'm, I'm doing everything I should, but just it's such a drastic cut, because I get down to 155, and I'm starting to, you know, feel pretty bad, but then it's like I have another 10 pounds of just liquid it's, and water weight, it's just, uh, it's tough, but I can do it, so, so really, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I could get in to the UFC 155 and, and perform and, and compete pretty well, then I would probably stay there. And if not, then I'll drop to 45. But um, I'm just kind of just waiting and kind of just playing it by ear. But uh, we'll see. I, I think I'm a pretty big 45-pounder. And uh, 55, I feel strength-wise I can hang with anybody. But I, I know I'd be a lot shorter than a lot of them. Mm-hmm. So that's the only kind of issues I'm having. But, but then again, that's when my wrestling will come into play or I can just get inside and work my, my boxing and beat up the body as well. Mm-hmm. Now, do you have a multiple fight contract with West Coast or have you just been doing single bout agreements? Yeah, just single bout agreements. I haven't signed a contract, so I'm not uh, locked in anywhere. So I can fight for whatever organization I, I want to. I just like to fight for West Coast. Brandon treats me well. Uh, it's one of the better organizations on the west coast and norcal there's a lot of people from all over the place that want to fight for west coast it's just such a great production Mm -hmm. now josh let's just say that your next fight doesn't take place in the octagon let's just say the ufc doesn't sign you and for your next fight you have to fight uh, back out on the regional circuit 
would you be willing to fight for a show like RFA or Legacy or Titan FC, one of those organizations? Because they're kind of on the same level as West Coast. They both have the same, all those organizations have the same mission statement. They want to get guys into the big shows, get guys into the UFC. So are you open to fighting for one of those organizations or are you just going to stick with West Coast? Yeah, maybe it just depends. I'd have to talk to, you know, of course, Uriah and my managers and teammates and coaches and see kind of what they think. I, I do like to fight um, for West Coast a lot, too, just because it's local. Mm-hmm. I'm from Sacramento, so I, I have a big draw, and everyone can actually come see and watch me fight. Um, RFA, maybe if I don't have to sign any type of contract, and just depending on what they would be willing to pay me, because I, I do pretty well um, for West Coast and in the Sacramento area. So I don't think I could make um, as much money in another organization as I do with them. Mm-hmm. Now, is this all you do for a living? Do you only fight, or do you work a second job? Um, no, I, I actually, um, I'm a co-owner of a CrossFit gym. It's a movement CrossFit in the Arden area here in Sacramento. So pretty much I, I teach classes. I have some personal clients, um, help run the business, and then I, I train full-time. So I just bounce back and forth, um, you know, Monday through Friday, and uh, they're, they're long days, of course, you know, like I'll get up, I'll go to practice, and then come back, teach some clients, teach a class, go back to practice, come back, teach more classes, but it's, uh, it's, it makes it, I, I, I can just do what I want to do, and I don't have a boss, I don't have to report to anyone, so I love it, and I, you know, I get to help people by training them and watching them reach their goals at my gym, and, and I have a, a big support group, and also the other owners of my gym, uh, they do a lot for me because it's myself and then it's my wife, Vanessa, and then I have three other friends, Mark, Jay, and Darren. So we all kind of have a second job, but um, any of us could do it on our own, but then that's all we'd be able to do. And I wouldn't be able to buy it. They wouldn't be able to do uh, work their other jobs. So it just works out really well and we all get along and, you know, oh. great. Oh, I see. I see. Two more questions before I let you go, Josh, and I really appreciate you being so liberal with your time. I know it's late on a Sunday night, so I I really appreciate the time. Um, Opponent-wise, is there anyone that you think is on the radar? Obviously, you're the champion for West Coast. You're not in the business of calling people out. You you have the belt, so they come to you. Is there anyone on the radar? Is there anyone who you think they'll possibly match you up next with if, if the UFC doesn't sign you? honestly don't even know to be honest i i think if the uh but like i said i fought at featherweight i've done a lot of catch weights some at 55 some at 60 i'm uh i don't really know if there's anyone in i honestly don't know if there's anyone that is much of a challenge in the 55 division right now for me but maybe they bring someone else in uh that hasn't fought for the organization but i I really don't know so i'm just kind of waiting to see what what happens here in the next few months or what brandon and west coast come up with oh okay okay i see i see now last question i've noticed that you don't have a nickname i've checked all the databases and i'm not seeing a nickname and team alpha male is notorious for having some of the best nicknames in the sport are there any prospects are there any nicknames that could potentially be linked to you is there anything the guys at the gym call you no there's there's nothing yet they just call me Emmett. actually you know by my last name right no uh no nicknames i haven't come up with any and i you know a lot of people are always trying to come up with some but there there just hasn't been any that have stuck so you know i'm good with just josh in it for now <laughs> okay okay stick with the nickname your parents gave you i like it i like it <laughs> <laughs> yeah josh real quick before i let you go do you have any sponsors you like to thank and is there anything you like to say to the fans uh yeah i just want to thank all my um my friends and family and coaches and teammates, everyone that's has supported me over these years and um, I just, I couldn't do it without them, so it, it's great, and then I also have um, I'd like to thank my sponsors um, Crown Khalifa, the Memory Tag, the Park Ultra Lounge, Camilla City Acupuncture, Glenn Middleton Family Dentistry, The Grace Project, War Cry Records, Le Schwab Tires, Forklifter Food Truck, Envisions, of course My Gym Movement CrossFit, Weightless, Torque, PS Construction, City of Keys, Vanquish, and of course, um, you know, like I said before, the best team in the world, Team Alpha Male. Josh, thank you for taking the time to talk. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it, too.